So, on January 13th, 2023, God rocked our world. Right there. That's my grandson. His name is August Dean. Emphasis on Dean is that's my middle name. So he was named after me. <laughs> and my dad. My dad's middle name was Dean, too. So, so. And uh, what's that, Dean? Oh, you got, there's a Dean back there. That's what that is. Okay. He's, so take the gain on line two down just a wee bit. Thanks. And uh, he was, so he was born in January. The next picture is him in about June or July of last year. And that, that's the look I often see from up here, <laughs> sometimes when I'm preaching, right? And uh, he's, you know how they get, they go from being these eating, pooping, sleeping automatons to actually having a personality a few months in, and it's just awesome. And now, recently, oh yeah, he's all that. He is all that, right there. It is fun watching one's children grow up, right, moms and dads? Isn't it great? It is more fun, and I have looked, people told me this would happen, and I agree now. It is more fun watching your grandchildren grow up. I haven't changed a single diaper. <laughs> you know? And I don't plan on it. <laughs> you, know, you know, there are parallels between our biological growth, as we kind of saw in little August there, and spiritual growth. You know, we, we talk about the different stages of biological life. There's the newborn, an infant, toddler, child, preteen, annoying adolescent, and adult. Right? So we, we see all those different steps. Kids of, 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 of a child, a baby going... For, from infant to an, to an adult. And in this, even in the spirit, our spiritual development, the Bible kind of gives us these, for lack of a better word, categories or these phases of growing up in the Lord. We're referred to sometimes as infants or babes in Christ by some of the, by some of the letters, uh, by Paul's letters. 1 John addresses those who are children, young men, and Fathers. So there's clearly different phases of growing up in the Lord, just as there are in biology, right? So growth is a part of life. We expect babies to grow up and one day become functioning adults. Some of you are still praying for that, right? Now, have you ever heard of the term arrested development? Not the TV show, you know which is an appropriate name, because this show is about a bunch of dysfunctional adults who never grew up, you know, basically. But arrested development is actually an abnormal state in which development has been stopped prematurely. In biology, it describes a phenomenon where something has interfered with a person's ability to grow into a fully functioning adult. Something has interfered with those normal growth processes. Things, things like trauma, not having a nurturing environment can, can arrest one's development. Genetic issues can factor in. Arrested development can be a spiritual phenomenon as well. The entire church at Corinth, the first letter of, of, of Paul to the Corinthians, was written to a whole church of believers who had, were experiencing arrested development. Listen to what Paul says to them in chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are steer, still worldly, now listen to this, mere infants in Christ. Clearly, there was some, that Paul was looking at these people and saying, you haven't progressed very far. Since you, coming, since you came to know Jesus. I gave you milk, not solid food, because you weren't ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. And this has been a few years. 
And Paul's looking, and, and he's kind of concerned in this whole letter of 1 Corinthians is basically written to a church that was not growing. Maybe it was growing numerically, but health-wise, it wasn't progressing in, in Christ as Paul expected it to. He describes these people as babes or infants. And he then, he then defines what characterizes being a babe or an infant in Christ. He says, first of all, you're worldly. You're marked by jealousy. You're squabbling. You're, everything you do is self-serving. You have these little nitpicky nee, 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 things going on among you. Right? You're following the flesh, not the spirit. Not the spirit of God. The same sentiment is echoed in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 12 to 14. And the, I'm going I'm to refer to the Hebrew writer as Paul. I acknowledge that there, there's debate about that, but just for the simplicity of referring to Hebrews, I'm going to say Paul wrote Hebrews. So in Hebrews, Paul says this, In fact, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. So Paul's looking at this audience to whom he's writing, and he says, you know, by this time in your, in your growth in Christ, you should be teaching other people. You should be impacting other people's lives. But you're not ready for that. You still need somebody to come along and hold your hand and teach you these basic principles about living for God all over again. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is not experienced in the word of righteousness. Now, what does that mean? This word experienced means experienced. You know, it's, it's knowing the word, but then living it out in your life and applying the word of God to the different things that life brings to you, and all that brings maturity, does it not? When we do that, when we're walking according to God's word, it brings us to maturity, and you're not there yet. You'll still need somebody to give you all that basic stuff all over again. For everyone who lives on milk is not experienced in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But solid food is for those who are full grown and by reason of use have their senses trained, notice the word trained, to discern good and evil. So the, the, the point being is that as we, ex we grow in the, ex in, in, in the word of righteousness, our, the gospel, right? We're going in a relationship with God. We're going through, a, everything that we experience becomes training for us to help us achieve what God wants us to achieve in life, but then also helps uh, to help us walk through and navigate life victoriously. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to live a victorious life. I relate to your story, Brenda. You know that. We, God has purpose for us to live victorious lives, not lives that get caught up in the same old stuff over and over and over again. Right? By this time you ought to be teachers, he said, but you need milk, not solid food. And I want to quickly just insert this. Sometimes we talk about the meat of the word. What's the meat? Well, it's prophecy or it's some deep theology. It is not. It has nothing to do with that. The meat of God's word is being able to live out God's will in your life according to the way the Holy Spirit leads you. That's the meat. It's not any teaching of theology. It's not, it's, it's not getting into the deeper things of the words. We, just, we need to get, you know, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us to desire the sincere milk of the word doesn't really refer to the Bible as meat, unless, in, unless it's in the King James Version and we're in the Psalms. We'll find a few references there. So, I want to give you an example by talking about Little Petey. You know who Little Petey is? Huh? How many of you recognize that picture? Those of you who cannot raise your hand have lived a deprived childhood. <laughs> right? Petey's the dog, by the way. I'm not talking about that Petey, though. I'm talking about this Petey right here. This guy. 
This Peter, the rash, loudmouth fisherman who was constantly sticking his foot in his mouth. Yeah. He was called by Jesus fishing one day. Jesus said, hey, let me get in your boat. I need to talk to this crowd. Go out to the water. And Peter's, I don't know, we've been fishing all night. Now this guy wants to commandeer my boat. And he acquiesces and, and slips off into the water there a little bit. Jesus preaches and he looks at Peter and says, now, go out a little further and throw your nets down. And Peter, well, we've been fishing all night, but nevertheless, because you said it, I'll do it. He's grumbling. What happens? Pulls in a big haul of fish, right? And then Peter recognizes he's in the presence of someone who's a little bit different than anybody else he's ever known. And he falls to his knees and said, Lord, depart from me. I am a wicked man. But he got that part right, Brody. He understood that. And he, that, was a good, that was a good step forward for him. But he, he would later go on to have Jesus call him Satan. Wow. Wow. Get behind me, Satan. You don't want what God wants. You want your own will. He cut off a person's ear trying to, to defend Jesus the very night he was arrested and a little while later denies Jesus, Jesus three times to the point that he cusses out this little servant girl to, you know, to, to prove I'm not one of his followers. Remember the stories? Right? Peter had some issues. Very immature. And yet some 35 years later, Peter the fisherman had become Peter the apostle. And we've been following his life in the book of Acts. It's amazing the transformation this man went through. He preached the first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2 and saw 3,000 souls come into the kingdom of God that day. Right? Amazing. Not the same guy. He confronted the same leaders that put Jesus to death on the cross. Holding them accountable for executing the Messiah. He faced severe persecution. He was beaten and then rejoiced about it. He had his prejudices and his bigotry challenged. He had to overcome a lot to become the, the apostle to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. He didn't want anything to do with Gentiles. And yet God used him to unlock the door of the gospel to the Gentiles. And you and I are here today because of that. He was freed by an angel one night when he was put in jail. After James had been executed. Acts chapter 12, do you remember? Put in, he was asleep in jail and the angel let him out. I mean, this guy experienced some pretty incredible things with God. He's the source of three books in the New Testament, Mark, 1st, and 2nd Peter. So he went on, obviously, when we look at Peter before the book of Acts, he's kind of a mess. But something happened in him over the course of his life that brings him to this place where he has a few things to say about growing up in the Lord. He, at 65 years or so, he's writing his last letter to the believers scattered throughout the Roman Empire. Soon he's going to be executed. He'll be crucified in Rome about the same time Paul is beheaded. If anyone displayed tremendous growth or maturity in his walk with God, I think it was the Apostle Peter. And so, like I said, he's got, if he's got something to say about growing up in the Lord, I think we probably should listen and with that, let's jump to 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to start reading at verse 3. And Peter says, His, and that's God's, divine power has given us everything we need for a godly, night, a, a godly life. So now camp on that for just a second. God, according to Peter, has given us everything we need to live a godly life. Now, in Greek, the word everything means everything. There is nothing lacking in you, in your relationship with God, when it comes to the toolbox that God has given you to live a life that pleases and honors Him. You lack nothing. It's all there in the person of the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Bible says, also fills you. That's pretty cool. 
that same power. He has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Now, I want to look at this word godly because it's easy for us to kind of go to the church definition of this word and to think, well, godly means I don't do bad things. That's not what's being communicated in this word here at all. To be godly actually describes a perspective God has of you. That has not, that's, that, that it's, it's more about how God sees you than it is about your deportment, your behavior. And so to be godly is to have God think and speak well of you. The Greek word is Eusebian for this, for godly here. And it's a combination of two words. You, which means good. So look at your neighbor and say, hey, you, because they're good. Right? The word you in Greek means good. But then the word sebo means worshiper. One who is devoted to God. One who is venerable and revered. This is describing you. Have you ever thought of yourself as venerable? And revered? Not in the sense that we talk about revering God, but in the fact that God reveres and respects you as his worshiper. We get the name Sebastian from this word, which means one who is venerable. That means when, when what Peter is telling us, God's given us everything we need to live the kind of life that makes God look at you, Ian, and say, I respect you. I am happy with you. You are the kind of worshiper I want following me. And that's true of all of us. A life that pleases God. Peter tells us that we can live lives that please God. More than that, we can live lives. Now, listen to this. That share and partake in and participate in God's own nature. 2 Peter 1.4 Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. Now what does participate mean here? It means just that, to share in, to partake of. Them to take on the characteristic of God's own nature. This is a game changer, gang. We can participate in the nature of God through these, these, these things that he's given us to live lives that are perfectly and wholly adequate, that please him, that make him look at us and go, you got it. We can, that's exactly right. Here's the process. Let's, let's think of this from biological terms. To grow biologically requires some things. It requires regular meals. Ideally, healthy meals. Right? Regular rest. There are some basic things that make biological life good. Makes us healthy, right? Avoiding some things. There are some things we should avoid if we want to live if we want to grow and develop biologically. Doing some things, like exercise, right? A nurturing environment is critical to growing up healthy. Instructions from those who are more than mature than oneself. That's where parents come in, guys, for a while. And then grandparents and elders in the church, those that are further along the road than you, can speak into your life and help you grow biologically. The same thing is true um, spiritually. Peter outlines what this process looks like for us spiritually. In 1 Peter 5 through 7, he says this, For this very reason, what reason? Participating in the, the divine nature of God, living lives that are godly and pleasing to him. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, there's that Eusebian word again, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. 
Now let's unpack this a little bit because there are a lot of Christians who are experiencing spiritual arrested development. Many believers, and this is not an indictment, it's an observation, many believers never move past faith. They remain in a place of spiritual arrested development. The church in the West, particularly, has settled into kind of a blasé, easy believism that does not require much to be a follower of Jesus. I said a prayer. I got dunked. I don't fall asleep during the sermons. Isn't that it? Isn't that enough? That, that, that we've, we've kind of allowed the definition of what it means to be a Christ follower to simply doing a few little things and showing up here and enduring sermon week after week after week, put some money in the offering every now and then. Yeah. Without ever considering how following Christ should impact us when it comes to changing us. I, and I want you to know, I believe in these things. I think it's important. You know, that first step of faith that a person takes to submit their lives to Christ, to ask Jesus into their heart, to be baptized, to become part of a, of a, of a good faith community. You know, that's essential, but it's only the beginning. That's only the beginning of what God has for us in our, in our lives with him here on this planet. Stopping here, if we just stop there where, hey, I accepted Jesus, I got baptized, I'm, I'm, I'm here and I, I do my thing and then I go home and I do my thing. If, if that's all, if that sums up our, the totality of our spiritual life, it's kind of leaving Augie as an infant, my grandson. That infant stage is adorable until it's not. Right? If Augie looked today like he did on the day he was born, we should have great reason. We have great reason for concern, don't we? Something has arrested his development. And yet spiritually, we have, some of us can, we can be in that kind of a, a position. I've known people that have been Christians years and years and years and years, and it seems like they've never moved beyond the simple beginnings of faith. yes. You know, the day you accepted Christ as your Savior, a new life was born into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. You know. But it doesn't end there. We start with faith. And notice that in Peter's admonition here. Add to your faith now. To that beginning point, add to it moral goodness. Start to pursue the, 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 a life that understands right and wrong and chooses right. That last statement is very important. Right and wrong and chooses right. Add to your faith moral goodness. And as you're growing there, add to moral goodness knowledge. And this is based knowledge that comes from experience. I'm, I'm in the word of God. I'm learning it. I'm growing it. I'm not yielding to temptation. I'm not pursuing my own self-interest. I'm experiencing God at a different level than I did with the day that I became a Christian. I'm finding that he's leading me to do things and he's speaking to me to do things. To that then, we add to our knowledge self-control. And to that perseverance, that hang in there attitude that you know, when we, first, when we first start walking this thing out, I don't know about you, but I, this is what my experience was. You know, I'd get knocked down, and it's like, oh, God, where were you? Well, get up, you know. Climb the tree, fall out, break an arm, it'll heal. We need to kind of experience that as Christians, too. Right? It's It's life. To grow, to, to, through the school of hard knocks, if you will. Yeah, to, to, that's how we kind of move into our adulthood. As in biologically, well, that, that's how it is spiritually, too. Perseverance. Not giving up. Hanging in there. Trying it again when you fail. Not just giving into it and say, oh, well, I messed that up. I guess 
No, no point trying to start again. No. Then to perseverance, godliness. That place of seeking, God, I want my life to please you. I want my life to please you. I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I am yours. You are mine. Father, when I get up in the morning, what have you got for us today? Who do you want me to speak to? What do you want me to do? In the process of doing all the stuff I have to do, work and tending to all the things that go on in life, what other assignment do you have for me today, Lord? Right? That's where the godliness comes in. And then finally, and notice that those things, this list here, kind of has to do with me personally. But it's not just about me. And Peter continues, add to godliness mutual affection. Or brotherly love, it says in other translations of the scriptures. That's, that's recognizing what God's doing in me, he's doing in you, Marianne. And we have a, there's something we can, there's a way we can journey together that's going to help us both become what God wants us to be. And that, that's true of all of us. These relationships we have in our fellowship are, to, are there to, if we'll, if we'll be wise and, and, and use them this way, to help us all grow in the unity of the faith, Ephesians chapter 4, so that we're no longer babes tossed around by every wind of doctrine, you know, but we grow and mature fully in Christ. That's where he wants to take us, as a collective body of believers and as individuals. Then to mutual affection, we add love. Love? When do I get to kill a giant with a slingshot? Or or call down some fire from heaven on, on God's enemies or my own enemies? When do I get to do that stuff? Well, now we're talking like Peter, before his transformation. It's not about that. Isn't it interesting how the end of all this growth is the little word love? You mean that the end of this, at the end of all this work, is to come to a place where I'm a person who is living in the love of God? Yes. Yes. Don't miss the significance of this. Love is the fruit of sharing in God's divine nature. Go back to what Peter said. We've been given everything we need to live lives that may God gives us a thumb up, thumbs up and be partakers of his divine nature. And love is the evidence of that. 1 John 4, 8. God is? Come on, say it. Love. John 3, 16, the most quoted, memorized verse of the scripture. What is it, how does it go? For God so loved. That's his nature. If you want to participate in the nature of God, you become a person who loves. And you can't become a person of love until you add to your faith moral goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, and mutual affection. It's a process. There's a whole chapter dedicated to helping the immature infants at Corinth understand the role that love plays in God's kingdom. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's not just a quote for, to use at a wedding. It describes what a mature believer in Christ looks like. So Peter summarizes the results like this. 2 Peter 1.8 If you possess these qualities, what qualities? Faith. Faith, hope, and love. Yeah, moral goodness, right? Knowledge, self-control. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, that means they're not, you, you don't, you're never going to get to a point where you've cap, put a cap on it. Well, I've got all the love I can get in my life now. I've got all the moral goodness there is to have. No. This is, and if you possess these things in increasing measure, just like a child that's growing, these things will grow, need to grow in us so that we become more perfect in love. 
Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love gives, gives us the ability to see past the earth suits that people wear to seeing the, the treasures that are in them because of God's spirit. Perfect love does a lot of things for us when it comes to being mature in Christ. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be ineffective. I don't want that. I don't want to be unproductive, and yet it would imply to me that if I don't possess these qualities, I'm not growing in these things in increasing measure, I'm going to be ineffective and unproductive in my knowledge of Christ. I'm going to be stuck as an infant, and when the rapture happens, and we call up, I'm going to show up in a diaper with a passy in my mouth. Now there's a sight. Right? Right? That's not what God has for us. That's not what he wants for us. First, 2 Peter 1.9. But whoever, and he, Peter kind of reinforces this idea. But whoever does not have them, that's those characteristics, is nearsighted and blind. I don't want God to look at me and say, you're nearsighted and you're blind. You missed a lot of things, Jeff. I already know I did. But I don't want to do it intentionally. You're, you're nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. Kind of like this guy. How many of you have ever seen Mr. Magoo? Again, if you have not, you have a deprived childhood. Right. But, that's, that's, but there are a lot of Christians that kind of go through their Christian life as Mr. Magoo. They can't see anything beyond them because they're blind and nearsighted because they haven't got past that, that point of faith. Well, yes, I believe in Jesus. And they keep making the same mistakes and having relationship issues and having uh, issues of, of related to, to addictions and all kinds of things that they can never get past because... They think that because they received Jesus as Savior and they were baptized and they go to church, that's it. It is not. Clearly. I hope you want to grow in your walk with God and that you're willing to pay whatever price God has for you to pay to become a wholly devoted follower of Jesus Christ who walks hand in hand with him every day looking for opportunities to serve him, for him to look at you and say you're godly. Let's not be spiritual Mr. Magoos, right? I don't want to be that. He concludes now, 2 Peter 1.10, worship team can come back. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort where have we heard this make every effort before? Right at the beginning. Make every effort to add to your faith moral goodness. Now, he's, after he talks about all this stuff, he reinforces the importance of us making the effort. Make every effort to confirm your calling and election, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Did you catch that last phrase? You will never stumble. That's a big promise. Life can be full of potholes and places where we can stumble. And that the promise is if we, will, if we will submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit and allow him to grow us, we will never stumble. And, if you, re- and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many of you want that? You want that? That's what I want. That well done, thou good and faithful servant. He's not going to say that to everybody. There'll be some people he just kind of goes, okay, come on. 
That's just because we became Christians doesn't earn well done. Well done comes from those who did well. It come, that's who that is for. And I want the Lord to say that of me. When I come before him, after all he did to buy my salvation, to secure my place in his kingdom, why would I settle for anything that would not bring, bring him pleasure? That's a big question for all of us, isn't it? Whatever that looks like in your life, however God's will unfolds in you, I want to encourage you to seize it. Add to your faith moral goodness, and to moral goodness, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your, your blessings. Thank you, God, that you love us just as we are, but you have no intention of leaving us there. Help us to be yielded to your spirit, God, to allow you to grow us. Lord, that it may be said when we stand before you that, Lord God, you were pleased, that you looked at us and said you were godly. You're the kind of worshiper I wanted all along. May we please you, Father. And I pray, God, for those who are struggling, God, with things. This is, Lord Jesus, that, that we know these, the challenges. Help them, Father, to see how to move on, to, how to grow. Help them, Lord, to let go of whatever is besetting them or holding them back. God, to find a, 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 in their walk with you a place of growing and, and seeing life truly change. Bless my brothers and sisters, Father God. Bless, bless our fellowship, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.